Thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm very honored to be watched by all these people on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> They're all dead. Right. Okay, so uh, we know now since a number of years uh, how much the microbiota has an impact on its host. Uh, I will focus more on the microbiota in the gut. Um, it's to the extent that we consider, some people consider the microbiota being like an organ with its input. For example, in the gut, it would be what you eat and an output, an output which is very important in terms of uh, metabolites. Uh, the microbiota uh, delivers from a fermentation of the food, but also a number of products which can manipulate or have an impact or is recognized by the immune system proximally or distally, uh, let's see how that works here, uh, in the gut, of course, a number of these metabolites are sources of energy, but also regulators of the, of, of, of the, of the intestine. A number of these things can travel further and impact on the, on the circulatory system. It can impact on the generation of uh, 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 immune cells and the bone marrow and the function of, of, of organs, but also uh, a number of these things can travel as far as the brain and impact or manipulates the functioning of the brain or the behavior of the host. So to the extent that a number of these things can be seen, can be viewed as, uh, as hormones. So I'd like to see the microbiota as not necessarily, uh, uh, or not all of them foreigners, but really part, uh, at least of them, uh, a number of them part of our own organism. So this is a picture of the intestine. This is, in, in, uh, for instance, the mouse intestine, just to show you the extent of this biofilm of uh, bacteria, here, only talking about bacteria in the gut, uh, to, to really visualize this biomass, which is equivalent in the gut to our own biomass. So I'm not a microbiologist, I'm an immunologist, and for immunologists, the problem is, in this mass of, uh, of, uh, of bacteria, how, make you, how do you make the difference between good and bad ones? There must be some bad ones which are hiding and take on the chance, the first opportunity to invade the host. So the classical answer to this is that we have we have different types of immune responses, one which sees good bacteria and induces anti-inflammatory responses, so tolerogenic responses to the good bacteria, and somehow the pro-inflammatory immunity sees the bad ones and reacts to them. So once uh, that is said, how does that work? So if nothing happens, no bad guys in the gut, this immune response would shut down this one, and if there's a bad guy coming into the gut, then you would switch on the pro-inflammatory responses. That's one way to see it. The other way to see it is that there's an equilibrium between the pro- and anti-inflammatory uh, responses, and this equilibrium defines health. So my issue with this is that remains the central question about how do you actually recognize bad guys? In my opinion, for the immune system, is it's difficult to recognize a bad bacteria as it is for us to recognize a bad person. <laughs> it's even worse because, as you know, someone which is, uh, who is uh, a murderer in one society can be seen as a hero in another one. And uh, for microbes, it's probably the same. Microbes on your skin, for example, can be good one day because it protects your skin from invaders. But the next day, if you injure your skin, they can go into the system and provoke the infection. Uh, there is an example from a colleague, uh, uh, Herbert Virgin in St. Louis, uh, Washington University, who showed, for example, the good side of herpes viruses. We all, or we, well, we all infected with herpes viruses. Some of us suffer from cold sores, which are not really aesthetic. He shows that mouths which are perfectly clean of this virus are quite susceptible to listeria infection. But these mouths which are pre-infected by herpes virus are more resistant to the infection by the bacteria, so showing the mutualistic nature of this virus. Yet, if you do a transplant to this mouse, or if you suffer transplant, you are immunosuppressed, and there there's a risk that the virus is going to kill you. It's a little bit like in a marriage. So my view on the role or the role of the immune system is it just reacts. 
It just reacts to the presence of microbes. Actually, it reacts to everything. It reacts to your own cells. If a cell starts to divide too much, it becomes a tumor, and the immune cells, the immune system does react to it. It recognizes also dead cells, so it reacts. Depending on, the, uh, depending on the microbe, some microbes are really invading, and there the immune response is going to be very strong. But the very fact that it does react will have consequences, but not necessarily in terms of defense. The notion that the immune system is, uh, is intrinsically for defense has historical grounds because uh, Pasteur and Koch have shown that microbes can be vectors of disease, and we had to come up with the immune system to understand why we don't die. The immune system is more than that. It reacts, and the very, the, the very fact that it reacts will have consequences. And let me just show you one. So what you see on the screen is the development of lymphoid tissues in mammals. What you actually see mechanistically is the development of an inflammation. When you now are infected somewhere, something very similar is going to happen. The green cells, lymphocytes, are going to cluster and induce an inflammation, which you see in red. And this inflammation is going to mean attracting more lymphocytes or other cells to tackle the infection or the injury. What the mammals have done is to program these events during development. So what you see is the programmed inflammation. There is no infection, no injury. It's a programmed inflammation which leads to the development of lymphoid tissues. And lymphoid tissues, your lymph nodes, are the, uh, the, the deport of your lymphocytes, and that's where the immune responses are primed. So this is programmed, this is automatic. After birth in mouse, what you see here is the, uh, uh, is the gut, uh, 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 gut uh, uh, small intestine of the mouse. The same happens, and that is probably what happens in all vertebrates, while what I showed you before happens only in, in mammals. In vertebrates and in mouse here, what you see is something very, very similar happening. You have these green cells, lymphoid cells clustering, and then they're going to attract, in red, these B cells making antibodies. And you have here a, 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 what you call a match of follicle, which is able to do antibodies, antibodies to the microbiota, to, uh, uh, to develop an equilibrium between the host and the microbiota. Now, what we have seen is that this development of uh, this lymphoid tissue is dependent on the microbiota. If you take a germ mouse without any bacteria, Nothing is going to happen, and you are stuck there. The microbes are going to sense, are going to be sensed by the epithelial cells when they divide. The sensing by the epithelial cells is going to induce a cascade of events which activates the things to make these lymphoid tissues. This is really to show how microbes at birth are going to participate in a developmental pathway here, in a, you know, in, for instance, in the development of the immune system. So uh, this would be one way of ontogeny, one way to see the, the ontogeny and maturation of the immune system. That's probably a traditional view of, of, uh, of seeing the things to understand the development of the immune system. That is, basically, we have development until birth, and at birth, it's a matter of maturation. That is probably very wrong for the immune system, very wrong for other systems, such as the brain. And I would argue that this period between birth and weaning is critical for ontogeny of the immune system as well, and probably also for the brain. So what happens here, the big difference, of course, between before birth and after birth is the income of new cells, bacteria, which are involved in a number of de developmental processes. And I'll show you just one example. I showed you one before, another one, where uh, the, the, the presence of this bacteria is important for the maturation of the immune system. So what we did was to quantify immune responses at several levels, from birth to the adult. So the mouse weaning is, is around three weeks, and it doesn't mean that the mouse stops milking. It means that it starts to eat solid food, as in human. So we quantified the number of immune responses and uh, parameters, and what you see is this huge, large bump of immune responses at weaning. It, it, that is a very strong response, which we call the weaning, the weaning reaction. By the way, in red, of course, these are not real data, but it reflects, of course, very, with high fidelity, the real data. In germ mouse, uh, there is no response. There is no response 
uh, there's no winning reaction. The winning reaction is just, just simply a strong reaction to the vast expansion of the bacterial population happening at waning. So at birth, the pup is colonized by microbiota from the environment, from the mother. But most of these bacteria are going to stay very low because the mouse and the baby is full of milk. So you have uh, an expansion of lactobacilli, another type of bacteria which can live in milk. At weaning, the, uh, the, uh, the, the income of silly food is going to be matched by a vast expansion of bacteria. You don't see it here because that's relative. These are relative uh, frequencies, uh, but in terms of absolute numbers, we'd have something going to up there to the roof. So what you have is just a strong response to the expansion, this vast expansion of bacteria happening at Wini. So we, we saw two things. So in terms of the concept I told you before, we expected this to be important for the ontogeny of the immune system, a little bit like you know, when a baby breathes the first time, it's like as if the immune system for the first time would respond. So um, there are two things we saw. One, there is a, a critical time window during which that happens, which we call the, the window, the time window of opportunity of this reaction. And then there's an imprinting, that is, if that does not happen, the mouse and probably the human as well, are going to suffer long-term consequences. So this is an experiment where, again, we quantify a number of uh, immune parameters. This, for instance, uh, TNF-alpha. So uh, in black, that's basically what I showed you before. This is a normal mouse, so the normal microbiota. You will see this reaction peaking at 21 days, three weeks, and then it goes down, and in adult, it's pretty flat. If you take a mouse without microbiota, a mouse in white here, nothing happens, so it's really induced by microbiota. Now what uh, the ads in the lab did was to take germ females, give them back normal microbiota starting at 14 days, and measure the response every two or three days after it. And what he sees is just the same, something you basically expect, because that's the first time you, the mouse sees bacteria, there is a response to these microbiota. What we didn't expect is that if you do that after weaning, nothing happens even though it's the first time the mouse is going to see microbes because it was germ-free, if you now give microbiota after weaning, then there's no response to this incoming microbiota. Defining this time window of opportunity, telling you that this weaning reaction is something which is programmed. It is always, a mouse always wins at three weeks. A human baby always wins between three and six months. So there's something which is defined in time. And what we know now is that milk is very important in defining its time window. Uh, others showed that milk, uh, milk carries a number of hormones which impact on the intestinal epithelium, and that defines, to some extent, the time window of this reaction. So even the milk changes with time, and this, uh, this evolution of milk is absolutely critical for this first reaction, strong reaction of the immune response. So um, the next question is, okay, I showed you that there is a time window of opportunity. What's the consequence of not having this winning reaction? So what Zia did was to just to block this reaction, uh, but then having mice living a normal life. So there are two ways to do it. You can give antibiotics between two and four weeks to block the, my, the microbiota uh, at that time, but then putting the mice together so that then after this treatment, they have a normal microbiota, and, uh, and they're perfectly controlled. The other way to do that is to give back microbiota before weaning or after weaning. So what, when he, what, what he then did was to, to leave the mouse uh, after, after this treatment together for two, two, three months. And after two to three months, when everything must have been forgotten, is to do a, a, a colitis experiment. So in mouse, you give the mouse to drink an irritant of the mucus and epithelium, this leads to colitis, and you measure the severity by number of parameters. This is one. So that's a normal mouse at, uh, at three, four months. Uh, of course, it doesn't, uh, doesn't lose weight because there's no treatment. If you take a normal mouse, this is the, the black line, uh, the mouse, uh, the, a normal mouse is going to uh, lose 10% of its weight. This is a recovery phase with water, then you start again. 
That's a typical uh, uh, colitis response to this irritant. If you now take an empty mouse without microbiota, it's extremely susceptible. It loses until 20% of its weight, and that is borderline to death. Now, uh, if Ziad gave the microbiota before weaning, or if he would not treat the mice with antibiotics during that period, it would be the gray line. You know, um, uh, behaving like normal mouse. But if you, he would give the microbiota after winning, after the time window of opportunity, that's too late, and the mouse behaves like a germ-free mouse. Very susceptible. So remember, the treatment only happens here, then everything is the same in the two groups, or the different groups of mouse, and you test it uh, weeks later. So that's what we call an imprinting. There's a phenomenon of memory of what happens during weaning, and if that's, uh, uh, this weaning reaction doesn't happen, then the mouse is extremely susceptible to colitis. So we have shown, we have found out how it is imprinted. That is, we know that certain bacteria must be there. Uh, we know that bacteria uh, able to ferment fibers to make short-chain fatty acids are necessary. We can rescue the mouse just giving short-chain fatty acids. We need pro-inflammatory bacteria, such as SFB. I'm going to show you a picture of this SFB, which is a, quite a cool bacteria. And it induces this type 3 Tregs, uh, whatever. These are a spe specific type of cells which are necessary to induce the imprinting. I'm not going to talk to you how the imprinting is prolonged over, over weeks. Uh, what we know is that the same mechanisms which have induced imprinting are not the ones which carry the memory. So it's not, there's not no memory, there's no memory in the microbiota which carries the, uh, the memory of what happens during weaning. It's not the T cells. The T cells induce the memory, but don't carry the memory. So what we do now is to find who is carrying the memory. So you might think about cells which are sticking around for a long time, such as stem cells, epithelial stem cells. You can think about the nervous system. Nerves don't renew so much and other cells which are very abundant in the gut, such as myoid cells. But I don't have the answer uh, right now. So, um, I'm not going to tell you much more uh, about this. Let me just tell you a few words about SFB and these, these T cells which are inducing imprinting. This is SFB. It's a very nice bacteria. Uh, which, uh, so something you don't see is the mucus. The most bacteria on the other side of the mucus, this one goes through, it binds to the petiole cells, and then it grows like this. It makes colonies. This is one, two, three bacteria. This is a colony, and it makes these spaghetti balls in the guts of mice, which are really cool. And because it touches directly the, uh, the uh, host, it's quite pro-inflammatory. And what we showed in that paper two years ago is that uh, these, these bacteria are very efficient in inducing these cells which I showed you are responsible for the imprinting. So I know this is hardcore immunology, but it's quite pretty simple. These are these anti-inflammatory T cells. These guys come from the thymus telling you not to attack yourself. These are the, the anti-inflammatory cells telling the immune system not to kill the bacteria. And you can see that without bacteria, just, they're just gone. These respond to the microbiota and uh, they tell your system not to kill uh, the bacteria. Uh, what we showed in that paper is that um, they do not only imprinting, they do other things. They cross-regulate the immune responses. So you might remember that I, I wrote somewhere that these were type 3 T regs. So I'll come to that. I know it's a little bit uh, voodoo. What they do is that they regulate type 2 responses. So type 2 responses are what you need to defend yourself against worms, but that's also what you do when you do allergy. So we had a mouse without these cells. The microbiota could not induce these specific cells. And the consequence is that if you do an, uh, uh, an allergy in the gut, it's terrible. This is an allergy induced in a normal mouse, so you have some mortality, but that's uh, a mouse without these T cells induced by the microbiota, and it's really bad. So an immune response is always the bright side and the dark side. I'll show you the dark side. This is the bright side. If you're very allergic, then actually you're very good against worms. Uh, if we put worms in a normal mouse, it has, this worm it has a, a hard time to get rid of it. But now these mm, mice, which cannot induce these cells, which are induced by bacteria, actually they're very good in a defense against 
worms because they're not cross-regulated. So let me finish on this concept, which uh, is quite central to what we do in the lab, is cross-regulation of the different type of immune responses. That is, there are different type of, of stereotypical responses for those who have looked in an uh, in, in immunology book, in, immunology is quite complex, but in the end, the finality of responses are pretty simple. You have to fight threats or microbes from the, from the inside, like viruses, and there's a, a series of mechanisms and, uh, and effectors to fight these threats. And then you do the opposite. You fight things coming from the outside, the microbes like bacteria, fungi, and these are type three. And then type two responses are mentioned against big things from the outside, which you cannot kill. And what you do is to construct walls so that these worms cannot penetrate in the system. So the immune system cannot do everything at the same time because it's too costly. And then the machinery to do so is very different. You cannot, if you mobilize things to do that, you cannot, then you cannot do that. And actually, the consequence is that if you fight a, a virus, you're going to block the fight against bacteria. And the colleague has shown that giving antibiotic is actually efficient against viruses. Why? Because killing bacteria is going to block these responses and therefore increase, as a consequence, the response against worms. So what I showed you just in a few slides before is that inducing uh, the microbiota induces this type of responses, bacteria, and these responses block these two responses. And I showed you how inducing responses against bacteria block allergy and responses against worms. And that leads me to my final slide, which is a slide from Jean-Francois Bach. And what he showed is an association, as you know, uh, between uh, a loss in now countries of exposure uh, to uh, infectious disease, and you would know that most of these are viruses or bacteria inducing type one responses. And there's uh, an association with the increase in allergic responses or autoimmune responses. And the explanation for me is a loss of cross-regulation. That is because you are less exposed to this, the type two responses or type two responses are lost and therefore as a consequence of an increased type one or type two responses, type two leading to allergy and type one leading to autoimmunity. Of course, the solution is not to give back tuberculosis or measles. Uh, the the uh, a possible solution is to give pieces of tuberculosis, pieces of viruses which are not infectious, but do the same on the immune system. And now we know how to do that. Okay, this leads me to my team. This is my team and the work on the imprinting is done by Ziad Al-Nabani who, uh, who works really very hard in this project to understand how that works. The project on, uh, on these T-regs, how these T-regs are induced by microbiota and cross-regulate responses has been initiated by Kaspar Onmarks now in Germany in Duhong Park and, and all the mouse this is our uh, mouse and uh, molecular biology wizard in the lab, François de Jardin, and we have worked with a number of people to make this happen. Thank you very much. Yes, Daniel Louvel. This is very nice. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm going as a outsider in a way to challenge your beautiful experiment on the imprinting and the DSS experiment. Essentially, you address the question of where is the memory? And your answer is, I don't know. Yet. And you talk about stem cells and other cells. There is a missing partner on your scheme, the epithelial cell themselves. Yes. And they get the renew fast. Yes. But there's a stem cell that stay there for the entire life. Yes. And where the, in essence, and this is my usual discussion with immunologists about inflammatory disease of the gut, everything is focused like the, if the primary problem issue comes from the immune system and the signaling that arises from the interaction with the environment from the epithelial cell is usually ignored. It's not, and believe me, I, we don't ignore so the epithelial cells. So where is the where is the memory? Uh, I don't know. In That's your what, experiment, I don't know. But I mentioned the stem cells, and I have good reason to believe in different experiments you do that epithelial cells are, are 
uh, extremely important. A maybe can Good, you should say it. <laughs> I said stem cells before. Yes. Which one? Which, did, which did, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Are you talking about the stem uh, cell of the immune system? No, no, no. no I no, think no, I no. said the epithelial stem cells. LGR5, LGR5. Who is my witness here? <laughs> no, no, I said. Good. So I was. No, no, I agree. I agree. I totally agree. agree. So I think we are. And uh, let me just mention other experiments where we show. Uh, by expressing bacterial compounds in epithelial cells, that the epithelial cells cell intrinsically can actually do everything and tell the immune system what to do. I'm, w I'm with you on this. Jean-François? Jean-François, you're back. Well, I was very interested by this uh, checkpoint at winning that you discussed. It fits with the fact that we observed that, like uh, as Finley did, we did it for both for allergy and autoimmunity that uh, if you give uh, antibiotics early, before weaning, uh, preferably starting with tre by treating the mother, you increase dramatically the frequency of allergy and uh, autoimmunity, in that particular case, diabetes. However, and I come back to the previous question for which I did not have the full answer. If you give lactobacilli after weaning, not too late, but at least uh, four, five, six weeks of age, you still have a very significant preventive effect on uh, the outcome of allergy and, and, and autoimmunity. So how would you explain this type of, uh, of data? Which for me is a bit uh, are still mystery because as I said, we don't really know how these lactobacilli work, not late in life, but later than winning. No, you're right. You know, I presented this a black and white matter because that's what we see in that system. And uh, there are two things we, we, we're testing currently. There must be a way to break this imprinting. And uh, just going with normal microbiota, which is not uh, incredibly pro-inflammatory, we cannot break this in imprinting. That is the bad imprinting because you didn't see microbiota twinning. We have still to try infection or something which is more vigorous to see whether we can still correct it after winning. There must be a way. And the opposite too, what happens if the imprinting or the winning reaction is too strong? That is, that is, if at winning you come with a pathogen which induces a very strong response, that must be too much and imprint something else. So you're, you're right, these are questions we ask because it cannot be so clean. Uh, one question, Karina uh, uh, Javier. This might be too naive, but how about the molecules from the milk? So if if you if you give um, bacteria to germ-free, you cannot induce the response if it's after weaning. But how about giving the microbiota to germ-free after weaning and exposed to uh, molecules from the milk? Um, so yeah, we did we did something similar. Um, we, so we tested the, the age of the milk. So the milk has to be three weeks to open this opportunity. It has to be three weeks. And the PTM has to be three weeks as well. It has to, to match. It's not that one is dominant on the other. Um, so the milk we can explain because I cannot really tell you what molecule because that's work from others. So there are hormones in the milk which open the time window. But the PTM seems to be closing it. If the milk opens it, the epithelium seems to close it in reaction to microbiota. So the two are matched. 